Hello everyone, welcome to Linguistics. Welcome to SOAS in the Linguistics space today. I'm really happy you have joined us here. Uh, so my name is Maria Fioraki. Um, let me introduce myself a little bit. I've been teaching at SOAS for um, quite many years now. I've been teaching a variety of, synta of syntax and uh, semantics uh, uh, modules. And um, it's always a pleasure to, to, to welcome uh, new students at SOAS and to, to show them uh, what an amazing uh, department we have and how exciting linguistics uh, are. So this is what I hope uh, I will show you today with this uh, presentation. But before I start, I can see here my colleagues as well, Jan and Justin, and of course, Valentina student ambassador. So maybe they want to, to say a few uh, words about themselves before we start. Uh, hi, uh, welcome to everyone. In, uh, uh, just like Maria, my name is um, Yan Jiang and I'm very proud of the, our Department of Linguistics, which has a very long tradition. And um, I teach um, some modules in linguistics in the, for uh, several years already. And uh, I look forward to we working with those of you who finally decide to come to Seoul. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jan. Okay, hello everyone. My name's uh, Justin Watkins. I'm professor of Burmese and linguistics. My interests are in Southeast Asian languages mostly um, and phonetics and linguistics in general. So descriptive linguistics um, and uh, more recently, social linguistics, all sorts of things. I've been teaching linguistics at SOAS for um, 22 years. And um, I'm very pleased to, to uh, welcome you um, to, uh, as applicants of what is the oldest linguistics department in the UK. We've been doing linguistics a very long time and we do it like no other linguistics department in the UK. So we, we have a really amazing focus on um, languages of the world beyond the UK, beyond English and beyond Europe. Um, and that's what makes us uh, exciting. So you're very welcome. Thanks. Thank you, Justin. Valentina, would you like to talk to us a little bit about you as well? Um, hi, uh, my name is Valentina Begun and I'm a first year at SOAS. I study Japanese and linguistics and I'm super excited to have, uh, to, to talk to so many people who are interested in linguistics as well. And hopefully we all have a fun time. Thank you, Valentina. Anyway, you will be able to ask any questions you, you have at the end of this uh, presentation. So I'm sure everybody will be happy to answer uh, any questions. Okay, so let's start, yeah? So it's the Linguistics Taster Day. Okay, so in order to, um, in order to, 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 to be able to introduce you to linguistics, let's have some uh, background as well uh, as to what the School of Languages, Cultures and Linguistics uh, is. Uh, so, SOAS, first of all, um, SOAS has 100 years of scholarship, which focuses on Africa and Asia. Over 30 languages are being taught. It has a huge library where national research is being done. It has the oldest linguistics department in UK, and we are very, very proud of it. Uh, also in SOAS, we house the Endangered Languages uh, Archive, uh, which is um, uh, quite interesting because all the students that are doing uh, field work all around the world, they can collect their material and deposit it in this uh, archive. And also any other researcher is able to do so, and then it's uh, uh, accessible by everyone. Um, the students and the staff, uh, they come from over 130 countries and uh, there is expertise in some of the world's key regions. Okay, about the School of Languages, Cultures and, and uh, Linguistics, it focuses on Africa, Near and Middle East, South Asia, Southeast Asia, and of course on linguistics. So the degrees that you're going to find in the School of, La of Languages, Cultures and Linguistics is of course the degree in linguistics, which can, it, which can be combined with uh, other subjects as well. So it's quite popular to have linguistics and Japanese, linguistics and Chinese, of course, linguistics and languages and cultures where you will find languages from Africa, uh, Middle East, um, South Asia, Southeast Asia. And um, also we have the linguistics combined with translation, which is a, another uh, popular uh, choice. 
Uh, there's, of course, the degree in Arabic as well, and the degree in languages and cultures, again, combined with uh, uh, another subject, if you wish to. One more combination which is quite popular is linguistics and social anthropology. So it doesn't have to be a combination of linguistics and a language only, but it can be um, another subject uh, as well. So there is a big variety, uh, basically, and accommodates all your uh, interests. Okay. About linguistics, what exactly do we do in a degree in linguistics? First of all, we look at uh, structural and theoretical linguistics that have to do with phonology, syntax, semantics, and pragmatics. And I'm going today to give you a taste of uh, syntax, actually, so as to, to get to know exactly what it is with a variety of languages. And we have a big language vari variation and also we focus on the changes among the languages. So we look at a variety of languages all around the world and actually the data sets that we are using come from all these languages. We focus on languages of Africa, Asia and Middle East, but there is also additional expertise in European, Australian and uh, American languages. Okay, so what I'm going to show you now is uh, the major world languages and where exactly we find them, in which countries we have the highest linguistic complexity, what we mean by structural diversity and what we mean by multilingualism as well. Okay, so um, the major world languages according to how many speakers speak them are the ones that you can see in this list. So we have English, Mandarin, Hindi, Spanish, French, Standard Arabic, Bengali, Russian, Portuguese, Indonesian, Urdu, Japanese, Swahili, Turkish, Western Punjabi, Vietnamese, Hausa, Egyptian Arabic, Thai, Amharic, Iranian, Persian. Out of all these languages, the ones that you can see, I'm sorry, the ones that you can see in red are languages that are being taught at SOAS. So we, we, we teach Mandarin, Hindi, Standard Arabic, Bengali, Indonesian, and so on and so forth. Yeah. So it's a very, very big variety of, uh, of languages. Where exactly do we find these languages? The biggest um, diversity in terms of the languages is found in Asia and Africa, as you can see from the percentages here. So 34% of the world's languages are spoken in Asia and 31% are spoken in Africa. And of course, af afterwards, we have the Pacific and the Americas that follow. Now, out of all these regions at SOAS, we focus on Africa and Asia. So you can understand that we uh, cover a very, very big variety of uh, uh, languages. Now, where do we find the uh, most uh, the languages with the, with, the, with the biggest linguistic complexity, you can see them here on this map with the red spots. And again, at SOAS, we focus on these regions where we can find the biggest diversity again. So it's Africa, Middle East, South Asia, Southeast Asia. Yeah, so these are the regions that we are extremely interested in uh, at uh, SOAS. Again, we have uh, all around the world, we have um, endangered languages, and you can see here their hotspots, where exactly we find them. What do we mean by endangered languages, which is something, it's a topic that we are very much interested at SOAS as well. So basically, there are languages that are, very, that are being spoken by very few, uh, very few people, and they're about to die, or they have, uh, they're in danger of, uh, of dying anyway. So uh, this is uh, where a lot of research is being done. Done. Many students go around and do their field work and, and they try to document these languages. So something to be preserved uh, from them or there are different programs that are being run so as to be able to maintain them and uh, incorporate them back into the uh, communities. And again, at SOAS, we focus on these regions where we have endangered languages. Again, it's Africa, it's Middle East, it's South Asia, Southeast Asia. Yeah, and of course, you can see a bit of Australia uh, there in the map where I'm going to show you actually today one language that has be, been spoken in exactly that uh, region in uh, Australia. Okay, so 90% of the world's population speaks one of 100 languages. 10% of the world's population speaks one of the remaining 6,000 plus languages. 
94% of the world's languages are spoken by 6% of the world's population, and 50% to 90% of the world's languages are endangered. Okay, so these are some useful statistics that we need to have um, in mind. Now, what about linguistics now? Yeah, what exactly we do at linguistics and the relevant chapters? First of all, we focus on the sounds of the different words. So we are very interested in phonetics, in phonology, in prosody. Then we are looking at the grammar of the language, where the grammar actually consists of morphology that has to do with what the words look like, the form of the words, in other words, yeah. We are interested in the word classes or syntactic categories, as we call them, yeah. So here you are going to find categorizations in terms of which words are nouns, verbs, adjectives, etc. Then we have the syntax that actually has to do with the structure of the language, the patterns that we find across the languages, the order of the different words, the order of the different phrases, how these combinations happen. And of course, we are interested in first language acquisition. Then another uh, subject in linguistics, it has to do with the meaning that is about the semantics of the words, what the words mean. Then we have pragmatics, which is exact again what the words mean, but now we put the context into uh, play and we try to interpret everything according to the context. And we have the first language acquisition again. And also we have an implementation of all this, the use yeah, of language, how we use the language. And uh, here we're de dealing again with pragmatics. We are dealing with discourse, which is basically uh, combinations of sentences, more than one, basically, and what exactly they mean and what are the combinations there. And also uh, language in the social world, which has to do with what we call sociolinguistics. How, so how language affects society or how society affects uh, the uh, language. So we have this uh, use as well. Okay, so, um, what I'm going to show you now is uh, basically, I want you to have a glimpse of um, what we do in a, in a first year undergraduate module in syntax or a master module in syntax. So basically what you will come across as soon as you come uh, at uh, SOAS, what, what you're going to come across in terms of, of syntax and the structure of language, yeah? So what I'm going to show to you is, um, differences in terms of phrase order, and you, you, you will see exactly what I mean, and also differences in terms of uh, uh, case systems. So let's take things from the very beginning and let me start with a language that we all know, English, yeah? And let's explore what we mean by structural ambiguity and why the phrase structure is so important and why syntax is so important, yeah? So here we have a phrase, the tall bishop's hat. Okay, if you, we look a little bit closely at this phrase, first of all, it's a phrase because we have a combination of words. They're stuck together, no matter where we are going to find that in the sentence, we cannot really separate them. So this is really the meaning of the phrase, okay? And here, this phrase is about a hat, yeah? And a hat has some more characteristics. It can be tall, it can be the bishop's hat, it can be specific with the, yeah? So we have all these other words that they can actually modify uh, the hat. Now, if we look a little bit closer at this phrase, we will see actually that there are two meanings involved. Okay, we have this adjective, the adjective tall, and we can understand that either the bishop is tall or that its hat is tall, yeah? And this is given to us with the two structures that we have in B and C. So we have the tall bishop's hat in B, where actually we have the bishop being tall and the bishop has a hat. And also we have the structure in C, where still we have a bishop's hat, this, the hat belongs to the bishop, but it's not the bishop that is tall, it's the hat that is tall. Okay, so how are we going to show this ambiguity? This ambiguity doesn't have to do with the meaning of the words. Tall means tall, bishop means bishop, hat means hat. We don't have any ambiguity in terms of that. But in terms of how we combine these words together, we get this ambiguity, and this is called the structural ambiguity. Another example, which is one of my favorite ones, and actually I always show it to the first year students, is this one, yeah? So she fed her piranha fish fingers. So. Look at here how many different meanings we can have, yeah? So we can have 
She fed her piranha fish fingers. She fed her piranha fish fingers and she fed her piranha fish fingers. Yeah, so according again to how we combine the different words together, we can have all these different meanings. And something really important here that you can see is actually the brackets, yeah, that the brackets show the phrases. Yeah, so here we have different phrases according to how we combine the different uh, words. Okay, now phrase, then it's a very, very important thing in syntax, yeah? But how can we identify the phrases and how can we identify the components of the phrases? Okay, um, first of all, we start with the words. And as I said, the words, they belong to different syntactic categories. So syntactic categories are nouns, verbs, adjectives, adverbs, yeah, all these different terms. And they help us to categorize the different words. So for example, in nouns, we know that nouns are all the objects or verbs, they may denote uh, actions or I don't know, adjectives, they say they have to say something about a noun. Yeah, so they describe a noun. So we have all these semantic criteria in order to identify the different syntactic uh, categories. And that could be a very good starting point. However, look at the sentence, yeah? The Winkies Dripner blocked Quastifocally into the Nindin with the Pidips. I'm sure that no one understands what this is talking about. Yeah. Yet there is something familiar about it. Of course, it's not English, but there is something familiar about it. It's like kind of English like. Yeah. Okay. We can kind of understand what the verb is. Yeah. Because we see here a word that has this ed at the end. So it's blocked, yeah? So let's start from this point. So here we have a blocking situation, yeah? Where somebody, an entity blocked, yeah? And that somebody, that entity that blocked was the Yinkis Dripner, yeah? We have a Dripner then here, which is not any Dripner, it's a Yinkis Dripner, yeah? And how did he block, did he or she block? He blocked uh, quasi-focally, yeah? So we have the manner of the blocking, and then where? Into the Nindin. And with whom? With the PDIPs. Okay. So again, here, we don't really understand what's going on. Yeah, we don't understand the meaning of each one of these words, but yet we understand what's going on. And we see here that it's extremely important, the form of each word. So we see this ER at the Dripner, and we can see that it's an entity that is doing something. Yeah or we see this ly at the quasifocally and we can understand that this modifies says, says something about this situation of blocking and so on and so forth yeah so we we identify the different syntactic categories according to the form according to the to where exactly we find them yeah what is the distribution yeah and all this type um, of things but enough about english yeah let's see what's going on cross linguistically now now, the languages of the world fall into different patterns of word order or phrase order, yeah, as we call it. So 43.3%, we find the subject first, the object second, and the verb last. Subject is what? Basically, it's the entity that initiates, yeah? And, and we, we can see that in many different positions in the sentence. The object is what? It's actually the entity that receives the action of the verb. Okay, and we can see here all the percentages according to the word orders that we have. And an example that I wanted to share with you is uh, Malay, yeah? I don't know if any of you know Malay, yeah? It doesn't really matter. It's a language which is spoken in Indonesia, Malaysia, Brunei, and many other, region, many other countries, yeah? Uh, but what we always look at syntax, even if we don't know a language, is always the second line in our example, which is called gloss or glossing. So here we have, and the glossing is what? It's one-to-one -one translation, basically, of the words that we have. So the first line, you have the original language. On the second line, you have the glossing. And on the third line, you have the translation. OK, so here, the first sentence says, Ahmad eat rice. Yeah, the translation is Ahmad is eating rice. So here we have a situation of eating. And there are two participants. One participant is Ahmad. The second participant is Rice. How are these two participants connected? They are connecting through the eating. Otherwise, there would not be a connection between the two. Ahmad is the subject that is doing the eating. Rice is the object that is being eaten. 
Okay, we got the second sentence, which is person, this, eat, fish. Again, we have an eating situation. A fish is being eaten at this particular case. Yeah, the fish then is the object. And now we see that the subject is the phrase person, this. Yeah, this person will be translated. And in this phrase that has the function, it has the job of the subject, we can see that the order of the words, person and this, it's completely different from what we find in English. And this is something really, really important. We are interested in this kind of differences because that way we can give the overall grammar of the language. We can identify the patterns that are there in the language, okay? And then in the third sentence, a little bit more complex, dog that, eat, bone, big. Again, we have an eating situation, but now the dog that, dog that is doing the eating and bone, big is being eaten. The first participant is dog that, the second participant is bone, big. And again, in these phrases, dog that, which is a noun phrase because it's talking about a dog, which is a noun, we can see again the order of the dog and the determiner that being different from what we find in English. And also with the bone and the big, big being the adjective that modifies the bone, again, the order is different. So if we wanted to show all these differences, yeah, this pattern that exists in Malay, the easiest way to do that is through very, very specific rules that we write down and we show all these different patterns. So basically we show the combinations of the phrases and we show what each phrase consists of. Each language can have its own rules. When we compare these rules, we can very, very easily identify the similarities and the differences among the languages. Okay, let's make things a little bit more complicated. So this is an Utah's Deccan language, Louisiana. And here we have the sentence, the boy tickled the girls. And the second sentence is the girls tickled the boy, yeah? Okay, we don't know whether this language has a fixed order, whether these components, they are fixed where we find them or whether we have a bigger um, uh, variation. But what we are interested in again here is the glossing. And you can see the glossing, it's a little bit more elaborate than before. Because the word boy comes with a nom, which is nominative case. So here we have the case systems that play a very, very important role. And the nominative case means actually what? That this has the function of the subject. This has the job of the subject. So the boy is the one that initiates whatever action the verb is about. And then we have the girl that comes with the infix pl for plural and the e at the end, which is for accusative case. So we have here another case, which is the case that is reserved for objects. So here we have a situation of tickling. It happened in the past and we can see that in, uh, in the glossing. And it is the boy that tickled the girls and not the other way around. And we can understand that from the cases, from the form, in other words, of the different words, okay? Now, in B, we reverse the situation. Now we have the girl tickling the boy. How do we understand that? Because now the girl is in nominative case, yeah? And the boy is in accusative. So now the girl is the subject and the boy is the object, okay? So again, here, the glossing is really, really important. Something else which is very, very significant in this language is that we find the verb being at the end. So the phrase order is in this particular language, subject, object, and verb. So we have here an instance of this particular pattern of, um, of phrase uh, order. Again, the same language, it has a, a, another very nice feature. So here we don't have sentences, we have phrases. The first phrase is the boy's father, and the second phrase is the boy's in the plural, father. Yeah. So how do we know what kind of phrases these are? So basically, how do we know which one of the two words is the most important in the phrase? We can see here that father has this prefix, third person singular, yeah, which means what? That it is a word that needs to find something in the phrase to agree with. And that something in the phrase is the boy. Okay, so the translation here is with the possessive noun phrase, the boy's father, and the father agrees with the boy because the boy is third person, he, yeah, and singular number. 
Now, this changes in the second example, where again we have father, but now it has a different prefix. It has the prefix pom for third person plural. And we can understand now that the father has to agree, has to find something else in the phrase that will be of third person and plural. So this something that is being found in this phrase is the boy, which is in plural. And of course, it's third person as well, because it's a he. So it's not the father that is plural. We are not going to translate it as fathers. It just needs to find something else to agree with, which is of plural number. So this is something very significant as well that we need to list in our phrase structure rules, yeah, and also show this kind of agreement that exists between the noun, yeah, father, and its dependent, which is the boy in the phrase. Okay. And finally, my favorite language, Walbiri, yeah. In Australia, it's spoken in, it's an endangered language, first of all, it's in the Northern Territory of uh, uh, Australia. I keep talking about phrases, yeah? And then this language comes and uh, destroys everything basically, yeah? Because let's see what's going on and how we can analyze this, this language. So we have three sentences here and they are all being translated as the two small children are chasing the dog. Okay, let's focus on the first sentence. We have child first in the glossing again. I'm looking at the second line. Child, which is dual number, which means two, yeah? And ergative case. So here we have a different type of case that we don't come across in the European languages. Only actually Basque has this type of case system. And um, this ergative case is reserved for subjects of transitive verb. So basically subjects that they need to have two participants. So we have child, ergative case, and we understand that's the subject because it's an ergative case. Then next to it, we have small, again, dual, ergative. So again, exactly the same agreement as child that we have here. So we understand that these two words, they have to go together. Small modifies the child, yeah? So it's a small child, small children to be more specific. Then we have another word, which is the word kapala. We don't know much about this word apart from the fact that it gives us the present tense and also dual. And then we have dog, which is an absolutive case. And this means that this is the object. So the absolutive case is the case of the objects in this type of system. And then we have the verb chase, which is non-past. So we understand that it's, it is two small children, which is the subject. Then the kapala is an auxiliary verb. So it gives us the, the tense are chasing the verb, the dog. Now, in terms of phrases, everything is straightforward here. Let's go to the second sentence now. And we can see again, the child is at the very beginning. Then we have the auxiliary as a second word. We have the object dog as the third word. Then we have the verb chase. And at the very end, we have the small. However, small still modifies the child, even though they are not together. Yeah, and this is, this is not something that we saw in terms of the phrases. We saw that when we have a phrase, we have to have their components stuck together, no matter where we're going to find them in the sentence. But here we see that we have these two components completely separated. The one is at the very beginning, the other one is at the end. And this shows that this particular language doesn't have phrases, but this doesn't mean that it doesn't have a structure of its own. Just the order is so flexible that anything can be found anywhere. So the question is, how are we going again to identify who is doing what to whom? Again, it's the case system that is extremely important. That's why we have ergative for the subject, absolutive for the object. And the third example, yeah, again, exactly the same translation, but again, the, all the components of the sentence are all over the place. We have dog now, the very beginning, the object. Then we have the auxiliary, second, child, third, chase, and small at the very end again. So again, the same translation, again, it's the case system that helps us, but the phrase order is completely flexible. How are we going to analyze that? Also, the phrase structures will help us identify what goes together with what, yeah? And also the morphology plays a very, very important role. So 
that was a very, very small introduction to the structure of different languages. Yeah, this is actually what the very, very first thing that you're going to do in, in any syntax uh, module uh, in uh, linguistics. Thank you very much for joining us and please ask any questions uh, you have. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. That was really, really insightful. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, just to emphasize uh, what Maria says, we do invite any questions. I'll be monitoring the chat feed. Um, if you have any questions, you can also pose them via the Q&A option, which is, again, just below uh, on the bottom of your screen. And you can also raise your hand. If you raise your hand, just to give you a heads up that what we'll do is unmute you so you can ask your question in person, but you will be recorded on the camera. So that's just to bear in mind. So as no questions are coming in, shall I, shall I fill the silence with an yeah, answer? Please do. <laughs> so Sorry, yeah, do interrupt me anyone at any time, but uh, rather than sit and stare at our Zoom screens in silence, um, I thought I might say a few things about the question that came in about, uh, uh, what was the question? Here we are. Um, so doing linguistics, we learn a bit of all the languages mentioned, or do we choose one language that we're interested in? I think as if you're doing linguistics, it's quite useful to separate the activity of doing linguistics on uh, languages in general or a group of languages uh, specifically and learning those languages in a way that um, you would go about studying them in order to be able to speak them. Um, and there's lots of overlap. I mean, linguists tend to be people who learn to speak lots of languages because they just find them interesting, but you don't have to do that as part of linguistics. So learning to speak languages is something that you can do and are encouraged to do as a linguistics student at, at SOAS, but you don't have to. And as a, as a linguistics student, um, you will come into contact with a wide variety of languages, um, some of which you might at some point wish to learn to speak a bit of if you want, but uh, there are other separate activities um, and that's perhaps worth, worth saying. So we've got a, another question in from uh, uh, one of our participants about the key differences between structural and theoretical linguistics. Um, maybe, Yen, do you want to talk about that or Maria? I may invite Aisha or Lutz because I- Oh, I, they're I, all here as well, aren't they? Yeah. And Aisha taught, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm here. Yes, sure, shall I speak? <laughs> is that okay? Uh, yes, so the difference, hello everyone, my name is Aisha. Um, the difference between structural and theoretical linguistics, I, I mean, the, 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 there are different definitions, I think, for what structural linguistics means, but if or if we take structural linguistic to mean that we are going to investigate the structure of languages, then we don't have to um, be theoretical in the sense that we don't have to follow a particular uh, theoretical framework. We can do this, um, you know, remaining um, neutral when it comes to a theoretical framework. Um, that's the difference. I mean, for me, that's the difference, but it's, it's a bit complicated to, to, to explain in, in two minutes here. Um, is that helpful? <laughs> Uh, I would say hopefully uh, that, that kind of answers some of the questions. I would just say to some of the attendees, if you feel like you'd like to follow up further, I'll leave my email address or get your contact details afterwards. Uh, there's a few questions coming in now, just to pick up one on the chat. It says, how are we assessed on the course? Uh, maybe I'm, I'm happy to speak. Hi, I'm, I'm Lutz Martin. I'm also in the linguistics department. My interest is African languages. I'm half in Africa, half in linguistics. Um, and um, I'm teaching um, a, a big module called Languages of the World, which is really exciting, um, and also historical linguistics and some African linguistics elements as well. Um, and the assessment, I think, is mainly, um, it's, it's usually a mix of assessments, so we want to, we, we're trying to have diverse assessments. Um, it's data, data set, so for example, some of the data Maria showed, 
Um, that could be a very good exercise. You get, get given data and then you ask different questions about how to analyze these data. Um, it might be, might be an exercise where you find your own data. So find examples of particular structures. And then you know, that's, that's another question in the chat actually about how the language learning integrates with the linguistics. And then one, and, and that happens in many different ways. Uh, but one of the ways might be that for the assignments, you can draw on the language you're learning. So if you're, if you're learning Hindi or, or Burmese or Swahili, um, and there is a question on maybe morphology or word order, then you can use examples from the language you're studying and use that for the linguistics assignment. Um, so a lot of the assessment is, is data related. There's also essays, of course, um, where you have more space to explain something or explore a question in more detail. Um, quite a bit of the assessment is quite free, so you can choose your own topic within, uh, within the given, given scope of the module. Um, and towards the end of the program, there's larger essays like independent study projects, uh, which are 10,000 words essays. Um, so there's quite a bit of diversity. And there's exams as well, not that many, uh, but some of our modules have exams, which at the moment, because of COVID, um, these would be open book exams, so, so take away exams. Thank you, Lutz. Uh, another question we've had is, what sort of jobs does linguistics uh, get you or lead on to? Will I have a go at that? <laughs> Please do. I think one of the um, one of the most exciting things about linguist, uh, linguistics is that it's a, it's a bit of a, a secret that linguistics prepares you for almost anything in your life, because it is um, for one thing it's a it's a it's a it's full of um, transferable skills. It teaches you to see patterns, analyze data. Um, uh, theorize about uh, about real world objects. So there are lots of um, very very um, important abstract skills that linguistics teaches you. And for that reason, people who've done linguistics go off and do all sorts of, of different things. Um, and I guess the thread that would tie them together is that they are interested in analyzing data, seeing patterns, interested in patterns. Um, but also, of course, the beauty of, of of language itself. So we, you know, there is a there are um, uh, overt language related careers that people go into, sort of being um, diplomats or um, working in NGOs in parts of the world where they've been interested in in the languages that are, that are spoken there. Um, but also people who go and work for Google and become computer programmers, people who are you know, all sorts of things. I think. Um, linguistics um, and of course there are many subjects that are studied under the the umbrella term linguistics so you can go from uh, sort of acoustic analysis um, and computational linguistics at uh, at one end to um, something more like uh, philosophy or um, uh, sociology at the other end and and every and anthropology and everything in between um, so uh, linguistics covers a very wide range of sorts of people and disciplines, um, uh, which can be combined in a in a unique way. So basically, linguistics is for everybody and prepares you for everything. Is what <laughs> is what I'll say at the end. But no, our, I mean our, our students. I'm trying to think of some great examples of what people have gone gone and done. I mean, working for Google is is one. Um, but uh, students who have uh, ended up in the civil service, people who've become diplomats. Um, people who've become translators or language scientists of, of one kind or another, clinicians, um, occasionally students who've done phonetics, all sorts of things. Brilliant. Uh, we've got about five minutes. I'm just going to pick up with a few more questions okay. that come in the Q&A. Sorry, can I interrupt? Uh, yes, please. Nana, perhaps you would like to introduce yourself as well and uh, talk a bit about translation. I think it can be connected to what people can do with linguistics as well. Thank you very much, Maria. Hello, everybody. My name is Nana. I'm head of School of Language and Cultures and Linguistics, but also I'm teaching translation studies. Um, we have now translation pathway, and from your second year, you can start taking translation modules, which is introduction to translation theory, um, machine technology, and translating cultures one and in your final year you can choose translation project instead of taking um, BA dissertation. Um, if you have any questions regarding um, BA translation pathway 
just please drop me an email. I will write my email address in the chat. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Nana. Um, yeah, so like I said, we've got about four minutes left now. So I'm just picking up on some of the questions that are here. Uh, what, how would the linguistics translation pathway differ from the main one? If someone's able to speak to that. I could answer that. So basically there are different modules from, so the, the first year it's common for all uh, linguistic students. And then from the second year, there is the translation pathway. And basically there is a different set of modules that are being taken that are specific for, uh, for translation. So you have um, introduction to translation, translation technology, from what I remember, different sets of modules that are specific for, from that, for that uh, pathway. Thank you. Uh, and what's the balance like between studying linguistics, uh, a language, and do they integrate, or studying linguistics plus a language, and do they integrate? Um, I can try and answer that. Um, I do uh, Japanese and linguistics. And in terms of uh, like a workload balance, uh, it is sometimes difficult just because learning a language in general is quite difficult. Um, but it's pretty manageable. You do get a sizable workload, though. And in terms of integrating, uh, it's a lot easier to study a language if you do have a little bit of, or if you uh, bring in your knowledge of linguistics while you're studying, it just becomes beneficial because you can draw uh, sort of comparisons and see different patterns in the language that you're studying. And it makes it a lot easier to study. Hopefully that helped. Brilliant. Um, are there any more questions that are coming through? We've got about two minutes left. Or is there anything else any of the academics would like to pick up on to kind of speak to? Yes, I mean, I can um, just to add to um, what Valentina was saying. Um, I think you know, many, many people doing linguistics are also, also interested in learning languages. And many people that uh, are doing linguistics at SOAS will be, will be learning a language. And they complement each other um, a great deal. Um, they are uh, different sorts of activities, of course, but the one definitely feeds in, into the other. The way that uh, Lutz has said, it's very, it's certainly possible to apply your linguistic uh, analysis that you're doing on the linguistic side of your degree to the language that you're, you're learning to speak uh, and understand in the language learning part of the degree. Um, in terms of balance, it rather dif dif differs depending which language you're learning. If you're doing Japanese, there's probably more Japanese in your degree than there would be if you were doing um, Burmese or Amharic, um, where perhaps less of the language is available. So that depends on the degree structure and particular combinations. Brilliant. Um, I'm, I'm going to wrap up now, guys, just because we've kind of reached our allotted time. So I hope that's OK with everyone. Thank you very, very much to all the attendees and the student ambassador for presenting today and answering the questions. Uh, and thank you for the attendees. What I'm going to do is just pop an email in the chat section. So if there's any more questions, I can make sure they're passed on to the linguistics team as well. Um, so please do reach out. Um, is there anything else you'd like to add, Maria? No, that's all. Thank you very much for joining us. It was a real, a real pleasure to have you uh, with us. And uh, I hope we get to see you in person. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you very you. much, everyone. Thank you very much. Thanks. See you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.